So we'll get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Adrian Terry. I am a member of uh, the um, uh, European and Middle East and Africa uh, Regional Committee of uh, the IIII. Um, at that committee, we found interesting to organize a series of sessions on uh, competition law and restructuring and insolvency law. Um, this is the first session, which will be focused on antitrust and uh, the so-called failing firm defense. And then we'll have a further second session uh, in May or June, which will be uh, touching on uh, state aid and uh, as well restructuring and, and insolvency law. We believe that competition law and, and, and bankruptcy law have many things in, in common. Um, both competition law and bankruptcy law are legal disciplines we, with a high dose of economics, um, either industrial economics, corporate finance. And besides, competition law and, and restructuring and insolvency law play a key role to warrant the very existence of uh, a market economy, either to assure the existence of competition itself or to assure the exit, the exit of uh, non-efficient competitors and assure uh, an efficient reallocation of, of resources. However, paradoxically, these two disciplines are seldom linked. So we could say that they are uh, sort of turning uh, their backs uh, on each other. However, COVID-19 brings an excellent opportunity to try to reconcile these two disciplines and reflect uh, about what they can learn from one another. First, because COVID-19 uh, extraordinary regulations have temporarily derogated, derogated or, or stayed a number of law, uh, and competition law and bankruptcy law are amongst the most affected disciplines by these extraordinary regulations. Um, we can speak about state aids, uh, bankruptcy moratoria, etc., uh, up to the point to asking ourselves whether we are still in a market economy. And second, this is a good uh, opportunity to reflect um, on, on, on the relation between these two disciplines because the crisis that will ensue from uh, the current pa pandemics, which is uh, likely to be, a, a, again, an over indebtedness uh, 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 crisis. Uh, that will probably cause that restructurings of uh, uh, companies uh, will not be so much performed through refinancings as traditionally, but rather through the sale of companies or distressed M&A, so um, business sales free of debt. And uh, distressed M&A um, and, so to speak, concentrations will, of course, bring uh, competition law concerns. And this brings us to where we are today and to the failing firm defense which is a, a competition law defense that may exceptionally allow for certain concentrations or mergers to take place if a number of requirements are met. And today, to illustrate us on the failing firm defense, we have the pleasure to count with uh, an excellent panel, which is composed of uh, Miguel de la Mano, which is an executive vice president as, at Compass Lexicon. He's former deputy chief competition economist at uh, the European Commission, and he's also the forming active chief economist at the UK Competition Commission. We have as well Roberto Ballina with us, which is a partner at the, the Roca and Union uh, law firm in Spain, and he heads the competition law department at this, uh, this firm. And last but not least, we have uh, Nicolas Stolenar, which is a partner at uh, uh, the uh, Dutch law firm uh, Resor, and he's uh, the author as well of uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the following publication, which is available at Oxford University Press, which is called Pre-Insolvency Proceedings, a Normative Foundation and Framework, which has been extremely influential in the, in the, in the last uh, uh, times, especially with the implementation of the restructuring directive. So Miguel and Roberto will uh, first expose the origin, status, and uh, the rationale of the failing firm defense and will uh, make a certain critique in order to try to improve its application going forward. And Nico will uh, subsequently uh, contribute certain uh, reflections um, on, on what the failing firm defense evokes from the standpoint of a restructuring and insolvency practitioner. And we'll finally reflect about whether synchronization between bankruptcy law and competition law could be improved uh, in, 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 uh, from the standpoint of, of merger control in distress situations. So welcome, uh, gentlemen. Many thanks for being with us today. Um, and starting with you, Roberto, um, I would be grateful if you could please uh, tell us about the, this failing firm defense, what it consists of, it, and its rationale. So the floor is yours, Roberto. Many thanks. 
Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, th thank you for the invitation to join um, this seminar on insolvency law. And I think this is a very interesting topic. I think this, uh, the fair and firm defense is at the crossroads at this intersection between insolvency law and competition law. And it is, and it's going to be a very relevant issue in the years to come in uh, the European Union and in the whole world as well, okay? So what is merger control about and what is uh, competition law about when we are talking about uh, mergers and the sale of business, mainly in the context of um, restructuring and insolvency proceedings? Well, what merger control does is to prevent or to establish a, um, a certain conditions if um, concentration between independent companies is likely to significantly impede effective competition. So, and today we are, I'm going to describe the general system for merger control in the European Union. And in most EU member states, it's substantially the same or at least um, Mm, equivalent to that of the European Union. Uh, so there are some procedural differences. There are some mm, differences with uh, when it comes to timing, procedures and phases, but the substance of the competition law test is the same in the EU member states and in the European Union. So merger control prevents the sale of business when such the uh, sale could would significantly impede effective competition. Such is the case, for example, when there is a high degree of concentration in the relevant market prior to the merger, when the market share of the parties is quite large, and uh, for example, when the uh, company or when the transaction, sorry, creates or strengthens a dominant position or also when it um, reduced the number of players in the market, for example, from five players, five companies, to four, from four to three, or three to two, okay? So, next, please. Uh, what, um, what is this, uh, why um, it is also relevant to take into account that in competition law proceedings, there are usually, uh, two main uh, stages. The first one is notification. A uh, transaction is filed for prior, prior approval to the competition authorities. And then it is examined first in first uh, phase, which is, uh, or, uh, and, um, it is usually roughly uh, a month or uh, two months, it depends on the EU member state or the European Commission. And then only if a, a transaction is deemed uh, that could impede, significantly impede effective competition on market, it could reach the second phase, which could take up to three additional months if uh, nothing extraordinarily uh, uh, makes it necessary to enlarge this time. However, the, the, very, the most important point is that most transactions are um, pre-notified to the uh, EU competition authority. This means that a draft of the filing is submitted to the competition authorities in order that so they, they can uh, make questions, request for additional information, and many times, and such is the case with the Fair Defense Defense, to, entail, to engage into negotiations about how the, the how if the transaction is likely to be approved or not, or under which conditions. It has to be said that many, many, many times the filing firm defense is raised not in the formal proceeding, but in the pre-notification stage. And if the parties the, uh, uh, are aware that the, that the competition authority is not likely to approve the operation on that basis, they either uh, reformulate the filing or uh, withdraw the, the, they, they decide to not to pursue the transaction because only uh, because it is only the filing frame defense, the sole possibility to get that transaction approved. And what is the filing frame defense? 
Well, the filing firm defense next. Um, the filing firm defense is when there is a merger between a target and a buyer who are competitors or close competitors. And the merger between the two would significantly impede competition. That is, maybe that it will create or strengthen a dominant position or even a monopoly. And the target is failing. So, uh, and we, I will describe here most, uh, mostly the European Union law regime by comparison to the EU, United States uh, system. Under EU law, a failing frame defense in the classic approach is likely to approve or is likely to accept that a transaction will be uh, approved by the competition authorities, will be clear. Uh, if um, the, comp the acquired com uh, undertaking is uh, likely, will, force, will be forced out of the market due to its deteriorating condition because it's filing or likely to fail. And if there is no less alternative uh, purchaser. The acquiring, the acquiring company uh, <coughs> uh, then would, like, uh, would take over the market share of the failing company if it is forced out of the market. I will put a, a practical example to it. Okay. Let's imagine that there is a duopoly on the market and the buyer has a 70% market share. The failing firm, if it has a 30% market share, uh, if they to merge, they will create a monopoly. What the competition authority uh, does is to examine the counterfactual scenario. What happens is the, in the absence of the transaction? In the absence of the transaction, the, if the failing firm is likely to fail, it will exit the market. In that scenario, the uh, market share of the, com of the potential buyer will be 100%. That is, they will, will have a monopoly. Therefore, in the uh, what, uh, if there is a merger between the two companies, the, re the, the result will be exactly the same. That is, if uh, the, the transaction is not the, uh, the reason why a monopoly is created. It is the, there is no causal link between the transaction and the creation of the monopoly because in the absence of the transaction, um, uh, the, fail, the, the firm will be exiting the market and the potential buyer will acquire all the market share anyway. This is a very strict scenario. These conditions are very strict. It almost works only if there is a duopoly. And duopolies are very rare. In both markets, there are no uh, duopolies, could be oligopolistic, or there could be um, a more diverse uh, scenario in which uh, there are many players. Therefore, it seems that the failing film defense would only work in a very, in, under very strict conditions. However, uh, the European Commission, after um, the Kalium Sals case, uh, chose a uh, more um, lenient approach, well, lenient is not a word, a more flexible word approach, and um, with the next failing film defense they, they analyzed. It was the Bas Eurodiol Pantokim case. In this case, um, the uh, German company Bas was um, analyzing to buy two chemical companies in Belgium, which are, we were in bankruptcy proceedings. And the, uh, the companies were likely to exit the market in case the, uh, the, um, the sale of the business was not approved by the European Commission. Um, however, in this market, there were many other players. Therefore, it was not sure that all the market share of the um, target companies will come to, the, uh, to BASP if the companies were uh, failing. Therefore, the, com the Commission found that it was also relevant to assess whether or not the assets would inevitably exit the market in the absence of the merger. I will put an example of this. Uh, let's imagine that the buyer, who is, has a 70%, 60% market share, 
um, is considering acquiring a, mark, a filing print who has a 20% market share. And there is a third player who has a 20% market share. If the company fails, it is likely that some of its market share will go to the buyer and it will have, for example, it go, uh, its market shares will increase from 60% to 75%. And, uh, but not all of its market share will go to the buyer. Uh, some part of it will go to the other player, which will have a, mar a market, share, market, sorry, market share increase from 20 to 25%. In that case, the Commission nevertheless took um, noted that the assets, as assets of the company, will exit the market. In the, those were uh, chemical production facilities in which uh, were operating now uh, uh, at that time, and if there were no potential uh, buyers for those pr uh, production facilities. Therefore, in the absence of the transaction, the assets will exit the market and uh, therefore uh, there were no, um, the production capacity of that, those chemical products will be significantly uh, deteriorated. Therefore, they consider that even in the, if in the absence, in case of a merger, the market share increase of the buyer will be higher it will pass from 60% to 80%. Therefore, there will be, it will be in the, in the in case of a merger, the, increase, the market share increase will be significantly higher than in the absence of the merger. The, 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 this transaction should, will be, was clear on grounds that the assets will exit the market. Therefore, there are three conditions under EU law for a failing firm defense to be successful. The firm will be in the near future be forced out of the market because of its financial difficulties if not taken over by another undertaking. There should be no less anti-competitive alternatives and the assets of the failing firm will exit the market. It is worth noting that these are not exactly the same conditions for the failing firm defense in the United States. And the US, United States law, what is relevant is the inability to meet financial obligations and the inability to reorganize under Chapter 11 of the uh, United States Bankruptcy Act. No reasonable uh, alternative less um, mm, uh, the, uh, altern uh, alternative less detrimental to competition should be available and the assets of the preliminary firm will exit the market anyway. Let's examine each of these conditions separately. What is a company failing? This is a case-by-case -case analysis, but um, it has to be proven that the, com that the com uh, company is unlikely to meet its financial obligations. In practice, competition authorities are only comfortable if the companies are in, uh, if the target is in a bankruptcy proceeding. However, that is not exactly what is required in theory. It is required that the, the, it is likely, the likelihood of the company will enter into bankruptcy in the absence of the merger. In the United States, it's also a case by case uh, by, uh, analysis but they exist, uh, they pay attention to more details and to, uh, there is a more um, detailed analysis, analytical, analytical framework. It is necessary to assess whether or not the financial capacity is sound, whether, whether, whether or not the liabilities are irreversible or not, and it is whether or not it is in, 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 unable to reorganize under chapter 11. Therefore, it is also necessary to assess whether or not the creditors are willing to help to restructure the company's debt. It is more detailed than in the, uh, uh, in the European Union, and I have to say to stress once again that the competition authorities are only comfortable if the company is already in bankruptcy procedures, which is not necessarily uh, needed under EU law, in theory at least. Second, it is necessary to assess whether there are alternative uh, purchasers. Um, those, uh, but 
not every any purchaser is acceptable. It does not have to be a competitor in the, in the sense that the alternative could purchases must cause less risk for and uh, from the point of view of competition law than the uh, existing potential buyer. And whether or not any other uh, buyer is um, uh, likely to uh, <clears throat> enhance efficiencies in the transaction. Also, um, um, in the United States, the process is more sophisticated, more complicated. Uh, they required that to, to provide evidence that the, the, there has been a process solicitation solicitating potential buyers and the offers in that solicitation process shall not discourage any possible potential buyer to the uh, target. A number and a variety, a large variety of companies must be contacted and in those contacts, sufficient information should be provided to any potential interest uh, acquirer. If there is an interest in order to um, buy the company, you have to provide sufficient ev evidences that uh, you have pursued seriously any possible interest of acquiring the company. And if you hire investment bankers, they have to be provided with proper incentives in the sense that they don't have to make the same fees if, the, uh, if finding an, an alternative buyer is successful or not. Last but not, least, but not least, it is necessary to provide evidence that the assets will exit the market. Um, therefore, it is necessary to um, provide evidence that they will be liquidated or reallocated in another market to a more efficient use. This is necessary under EU law because it, you have to provide evidence that even if the assets are, buyer, are bought by another buyer and put to use in another market, it will lead to a decrease in output in the current market to the detriment of consumers. That is, the consumers will face, will face higher prices or a uh, less variety of products due to the fact that these assets have exited the market. Under US law, United States law, it's, um, the condition is similar, but you have to provide objective evidence that it is not more profitable for uh, the um, assets to continue, to continue to operate in the market than to be employed as well elsewhere. That is, it is likely that the uh, assets are more profitable in the uh, current market than in, in any, other, any, any other market. It seems implied that the price mill liquidation value is above liquidation value in this case. Okay, last, I will explain that there are two alternatives, there are two uh, variations of the failing fin difference. It is possible to submit that not the, the, the firm as a whole is failing, but only a division. And in that case, you have to provide very serious evidence, and not only the accountants of the company, that the failing is, uh, that the, that division is unable to operate in that market. This is very strict and has been rejected all the, uh, every time that it has been submitted to the European Commission in the last 20 years. No company has been uh, able to provide sufficient evidence that only a division is uh, failing and not the company as a whole. And uh, it is also possible not to submit that the, uh, fail, that the firm is failing, but it's failing. This, uh, this is an American expression, and this, this suggests that this competitor is weakened. This is not a defense. This will not provide for an exemption of the merger control the, uh, regime, but it, it suggests that the competition authorities should take due account that the current financial situation makes less likely that this will be an efficient competitor in the market in the, in the years to come. It will, maybe it will be operating in the market in one, one way or another, but it will not be a relevant source of potential competition to other firms in the market. Therefore, 
the, should, the major control regime should be more lenient. So I, I think I have, I, this is more or less a quick overview of the failing uh, regime under EU law. Adrian. Many thanks, Roberto. Very comprehensive and very clear. And uh, the, the comparison between the, the EU regime and the, and the US regime is uh, very fortunate. Um, so Miguel, um, uh, welcome to the, to the panel. Um, uh, I understand that you have a, a very uh, uh, extensive uh, comparison in, in antitrust matters. And actually, you were an officer at the EU Commission at the time when the 2004 guidelines uh, were, were enacted. So welcome to the panel. Um, um, I, I, would very, I would be very much interested in hearing your views on, on uh, uh, whether the, the manner in which the, 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 the criteria uh, for the application of the failing from defense uh, is, is being applied, uh, whether those criteria could be, in your view, um, uh, improved and uh, whether the manner in which they are applied in the, in the EU um, deserves uh, any critic, uh, any critic as, as compared to the, to the US. So the floor is yours, Miguel. Many thanks. Very good. Um, thank you very much. It, it's really a pleasure to be here. I hope you can hear me well. I have uh, shared my screen as well. I have a few slides um, and if, I hope you can, you can also see them. Uh, but if not, then don't hesitate, of course, to interrupt and ask, ask any questions. Um, indeed, as you pointed out, um, I, I'm going to be quite critical of how the Fending from Defense is applied in, in Europe, uh, in particular by contrast to the Fending from Defense as, as applied and, and designed really in, in the United States. Um, and I should stress maybe at the outset that um, I, I, I am a, an interested party here, both because I, I work advising companies that, that may, uh, in many circumstances, choose to or want to uh, request a, a failing f uh, defense in the context of measure. Um, and so obviously I, I have uh, an interest in, in facilitating that process, but, but also uh, maybe quite ironically, uh, because um, while I was at the commission, while I was working with DGCOM for many years, I actually worked on the drafting of the horizontal merger guidelines, which include the failing from defense. So effectively, I'm, I'm going to be criticizing the work that, that I did together with my, with my colleagues uh, 15 years ago. Uh, but, you know, the thing is that what you learn from experience, and I think that experience shows that the failing from defense of designing Europe is, is not fit for purpose. Um, now, the, the, my, my, my point is going to be illustrated also by the fact that we're living through a, through a tremendous crisis, and as only one would expect that more firms require to restructure and reorganize and maybe mergers is an efficient way to do so. I uh, so we expect more uh, mergers to be notified to the authorities um, uh, seeking uh, to, to fall under the thing from defense, even if they're anti-competitive mergers. And I would expect those mergers, some of those mergers to be, to be authorized, uh, not because the standards would be lowered, but because, you know, indeed there's just more firms that are, that are failing. But that, this has not happened over the past year. And, and as I mentioned, I think it's because the the uh, the, uh, the frame from is flawed. Um, very briefly, I'm not going to get into the slide because we've we've heard uh, already Roberto um, very very detailed explanation. Just wanted to make two points on the slide, which sort of um, presents the frame from the both in the U.S. and the EU guidelines. One is that um, the basic requirement in the U.S. to apply the frame from the frame is, is a rather objective one. So at the very top there, uh, it, it says that you know, there's an imminent failure of one of the merging firms uh, would, would cause the assets of that firm to exit the relevant market. And I'll come back to relevant in a moment because it's important. Uh, but so the basic requirement is, is an objective requirement. Is you need to demonstrate imminent failure of one of the firms and need to demonstrate the assets of that firm will exit the relevant market. And then there's a series of, of steps to do that. In, in the EU context, the basic requirement is far more uh, you know, subjective or less defined. Uh, it's the deterioration of the competitive structure cannot be said to be caused by the merger. It's pointing to a, a sort of a counterfactual analysis uh, where one would look at, in the absence of a merger, you know, how would um, competition materialize between the target and the, and the acquirer uh, and compare that with what happens if, if the merger is, is taken over. And in, in the first, in the assessment of the factual, we take into account maybe 
the target will, will eventually uh, disappear because it's in financial difficulties or it serves as a competitive constraint. So at face value, you know, it, it's, it's, you know both approaches are, pro are adequate, except that the EU, guy, the EU approach is, is, is way too subjective. And as I would then try to argue, it just doesn't allow the parties to make a proper, proper defense. And, and just two quick words, and I won't come back to this later, on, on failing division, the US guidelines um, provides guidance, uh, direct guideline guidance on, on failing division, that it, you know, it applies um, and gives the conditions when it will be met, uh, whereas there's no such formal guidance in, in Europe. But there's one case, just one, uh, where it was then where the, the commission said, well, this is a failing division, but, uh, and, and the first condition of failing from defense is not met because the firm will continue to exist, this, this firm was Shell. But the EC was convinced that this division that Shell was seeking to sell would otherwise be shut down without the merger. And so um, in, in principle, the basic requirement was met, even though the failing from defense was, was not met. Um, and there is no, uh, so that, that's the prospect that the EU would consider failing divisions, even though it's not explicitly mentioned in the, in the guidelines. And, and the flaming firm, uh, as, as Roberto explained, you know, there is evidence in, in the US that it matters. Uh, there's at least two cases where it has played a role, uh, but there is no, again, far more guidance in Europe. And it's quite unlikely that the, the EC would, would be flexible to take into account of flaming, flaming from the firms. So now moving on to, you know, who has the burden to show the criteria for failing from defense are met. So in all jurisdictions, the burden is, is on the merging parties. However, my, I would argue, and I think it will become clear as, as I develop the arguments uh, on how to apply the criteria in a moment, that the burden weighs more heavily in Europe uh, for many reasons. First, um, as mentioned, the criteria is not as objective in the US, but maybe more importantly, in Europe, the EC is prosecutor and jury. So basically it's an administrative court uh, the parties go to it, argue that the federal front defense should apply, and um, and then the, the the EC has to decide whether that's true or not, right? Um, whereas in the US, they have to go to to challenge the merging court, and it's up to the judge to decide whether the conditions are, are apply or, or or not apply. And uh, this, of course, you know, leads the US agencies to be especially careful. In, in denying a felon from defense when, when the facts are there that, that may, may be appropriate, whereas the EU you know, essentially bears no consequences from uh, making a, um, a, a type two error in these circumstances. Um, and also the EC needs to draft a decision, which then becomes public, it can be challenged, it can set precedents, and, and the Commission doesn't want to do that um, if this leads to, to an abuse of the felon from defense in the future. Uh, and of course, there is no guidance on, on what evidence is dispositive. All we have is you know, a couple of paragraphs in the merger guidelines. So as a consequence, there's evidence as shown here that uh, in the US, the federal front defense tends to be more successful than in Europe, where there's only really three cases, two of which are old, which um, Roberta mentioned. And the only recent one is the Olympic Asian merger, which actually uh, is a sort of weird federal front defense because it was, the merger was first prohibited uh, and then two years later, when it became clear the commission had, had made the wrong decision, uh, the parties applied again for a merger asking for further from the firms, and then it was, it was, it was then finally uh, authorized. But, but the instinct first was to prohibit. And again, I should say I was involved in, in, in that prohibition. So in a way, I'm, I'm criticizing um, myself in issuing that, that, that decision. Now, so coming to the, to, you know, why I believe that the application of the federal in Europe is, is flawed. And, and so to illustrate, I'll compare with, with the US. So in the US, um, the idea of financial difficulties is captured by conditions one or two. First, that you need to establish that the firm will not be able to meet future obligations. And second, that the firm will be able to reorganize successfully under chapter 11. Um, there are, you know, a set of, 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 of elements of evidence that, that are valid. Uh, and, and, and sudden, but they're not valid. So just declining sales or net losses don't, don't count. Mismanagement doesn't count. Temporal liquidity problems don't count. Uh, but if you establish that you cannot meet your obligations, if, if the inflows of cash are not gonna be enough to pay for your debt in the future, then, then you essentially meet the first condition. And, and with regards to the second one is straightforward. You know, can you reorganize successful in chapter 11? And there's an enormous amount of, of um, uh, evidence and, and, and precedent on the application of chapter 11 in the US that can be brought to bear to, to take this decision. Now in Europe, by contrast, the first condition, which is sort of, as Roberto explained, sort of precise with first two conditions in, in the US, 
it is very vague. It's just the firm has financial difficulties and it will likely exit the market, right? Uh, and, and the market in general, right? Not the relevant market, but the market in general. Um, and I'll come back to that in, in a moment uh, as well. So, so why is this a subjective assessment? Well, there is no direct reference to bankruptcy or legal requirements. Um, and although it's often meant to, to mean that the firm is going to go into bankruptcy, uh, you know, they have different bankruptcy laws across across Europe. Proceedings differ significantly. It's never clear, you know, when is that bankruptcy process going to be triggered and then what the circumstances are. It could differ from, from country to country. Um, there is no clarity on, on what is this time horizon, right, in the near future uh, that the Commission needs to look at. Is it uh, three months? Is it a year? Is it five years? In the context of COVID, for example, um, obviously, you know, some firms are facing liquidity uh, troubles that are only other temporary if, if demand were to recover quickly, but if demand takes long to recover, those liquidity problems will eventually lead to, to, a structural, uh, to a structural breakdown or bankruptcy. And, and this, you know, the relevant time horizon doesn't give any, any the, the, in the near future, so it doesn't give any clarity on, on what, what the Commission will consider uh, appropriate uh, horizon. And, and of course, you know, if you have situations where um, the Commission will, will take a year essentially to take a decision. Uh, but by the time the, the merger is notified to the Commission and the failing from defense uh, invoked, um, the Commission goes on to make its, its decision. It takes a whole year. By then, the, the firm uh, will, will probably be uh, bankrupt in circumstances like the ones we're facing today. And, and then there's a problem. There is no reference to restructuring. In, in the US, you have the second condition. Restructuring at Chapter 11 is not possible. Uh, now, there in Europe, you, you don't have this. Um, so the Commission can often say, well, you know, the first condition is not met because there is a way to restructure. And it doesn't really matter whether it's credible or not. At least there's no criteria to determine how, how to assess credibility. Uh, it, it's just enough to invoke that, that restructuring is a possibility, uh, irrespective of, you know, how the firm or whether indeed the firm will come out from restructuring, uh, I, I, you know, uh, in, in, in the future. And, and then last but not least, parties that want to invoke a failing from defense and meet this first condition, they typically fail because um, the evidence that the commission requires is that um, the firm firm has been seeking uh, buyers uh, and, and, you know, but the, and there's more offers out there as, as, as we come up in a moment, but obviously no firm wants to admit it's going into bankruptcy uh, because that's going to lead to uh, a much lower uh, purchase price. So a lot of the uh, evidence, internal evidence, doesn't actually demonstrate, internal documents from the party doesn't actually demonstrate uh, easily that, that um, the, you know, the, the film firm is indeed going to go bankrupt. Uh, that's something that's maybe inevitable, but it's not something that you can find necessarily evidence inside, inside the firm. Uh, and of course, they don't want to discourage customers uh, by publicly ad admitting that the firm is at the verge of bankruptcy. You think about airlines, if you hear about a firm that um, an, an airline that is going to go bankrupt in three months because it's running out of cash, you are not likely to buy uh, any, any tickets. So then, and if any any you know to fly without that airline, which means that this is going to be self fulfilling information. And or, or cars, car manufacturers, who say they they might go out of business in the future. Again, you don't want to have a lot of durable good in your hands where you need spare parts and repairs, and the the car manufacturer is not going to be around anymore. So very difficult to prove uh, how you're going to end up in bankruptcy in, in Europe. Now, the alternative buyer criteria, I will, I will skip only just to say that um, in, in the US, uh, again, you have a list of elements of evidence that one can bring, bring to bear. Whereas, and one of them is that the, the, the buyer, the alternative buyer, um, you know, has to be offering a price above the liquidation value. This is the liquidation value requirement, even if it's below the purchase price of the, of the acquirer, uh, the proposed acquirer. Um, and, and then, it, you know, then you actually don't need the condition and then the U.S. can reject the failing from defense. But that also implies that if the purchase price is below the liquidation value, then uh, effectively there is no alternative buy, right, in the, in the meaning of, of the U.S. Uh, criterion. But in Europe, there is no such liquidation value requirement. So any offer, even if it's very low, even if it's even below liquidation value, can be considered as acceptable by, by the EU and therefore as a, as a way to reject the failing from defense. Um, and then, and this is the final point, which I think it's, it's a bit subtle, but it's maybe the most important. Um, now, as you probably noticed, um, in, in the US, if you meet the first two conditions, so um, that there is, um, the firm is going to not going to meet its liabilities, 
for its debts and that it cannot restructure under Chapter 11, then the default is that the assets are going to exit the market. That, that's what that, those, those conditions imply. Now, there's one exception that if you have another buyer who comes in, uh, takes over those assets, and keeps those assets in the relevant market, uh, in the market where the authority has established that the competition problems. So, in order to show right, that the condition three is met, the target can make, uh, you know, can, can meet that condition in, in, in three scenarios. It can show that no such offer exists, there's no alternative buyer. That the alternative offer would be s and competitive or more, that's obvious, but also that there are offers, uh, but that the alternative buyer actually will take those assets and use them somewhere else. So let me illustrate. Imagine we're talking about a, an airline who's going bankrupt, and you have an alternative buyer that will take those assets, and um, it will start using those assets to, to fly routes that uh, have nothing to do with the competition concerns identified by the authorities, right? So authorities say um, there's going to be a problem in London, New York, if these two firms merge, the proposed target, and then the acquirer merge. But there's a third party, another airline that takes over those assets uh, and uses those assets in to fly uh, Los Angeles, um, Paris, right? So those assets are exiting, exiting, exiting the market. They're not in the relevant market anymore. Uh, and therefore, in the U.S., you can say condition three is not met. There is an alternative buyer, but it's going to redeploy those assets to another relevant market. Therefore, it doesn't, you know, this condition is met. That can avoid the feeling from defense. You cannot do that in Europe, right? In Europe, meeting condition one, financial difficulties, and also condition two are different from condition three. You know, in, in the U.S., con condition on the alternative buyer is linked to the, whether the, the assets will exit the market or not. Not in Europe, asset exit, exit in the market is a third independent condition. What this means is that this condition will not be met, and therefore the failing firm defense will be rejected, even if you have two scenarios. One where the alternative buyer redeploys the assets to another relevant market, as mentioned, even if that happens, uh, and you could argue that you know, there's no competition problem uh, relative to the counterfactual, uh, still the condition can reject the failing firm defense. And second, uh, the assets could be acquired in liquidation, by firms that are operating in the market and uh, and therefore the assets will stay technically in the market but again that doesn't mean they'll stay in the relevant market and therefore uh, again the commission could say well condition three is rejected uh, even in a future scenario with bankruptcy and liquidation and, and and sale of those assets including for example intangible intangible assets so if the brand of, of an airline uh, is acquired by somebody else uh, and that is used in the, in, in, in the market, even if it's not in the, used in the, in the rules where there are concerns, the commission can say, oh, the assets are not actually in the market and therefore failing from this is rejected. Right, and then just to conclude, uh, I already mentioned this, uh, another point which is, uh, you know, sort of more pragmatism versus ideological orthodoxy. I mean, you could argue that in, in all of this doesn't matter in Europe because the way the Federal Fund Defense is drafted, there's enough flexibility for the, for the commission to say something like, well, um, in reality, just a, all, all, all Federal Fund Defense is, is a counterfactual analysis. If, um, if the target, the failing firm, will not exert a competitive pressure in the future because it's in financial difficulties, um, I can still con consider that as part of the of the counterfactual analysis and therefore argue that there is no competition problem that is created directly by, by this merger. But the reality is that, that that flexibility is not at all used. In fact, the Commission applies this federal front defense in a very strict way, uh, and especially if you contrast it with the way they look at state aid. So in state aid, uh, they have approved a lot of state aid, uh, which effectively means that firms that are in financial distress are being supported by taxpayers. Um, but when it comes to, to a, a you know, a merger where a acquiring firm wants to buy a failing firm, which is a competitor, and, and if it does, uh, it can, you know, the commission is correct and the, the competition problems are there, they would allow the acquiring uh, firm to raise prices, maybe harm uh, the customers in that market. In that case, the guys that, that are sustaining that failing firm, the firms implicitly are the, the customers of, of the failing firm, uh, not the overall taxpayers. But the question is, really, is it legitimate to, to uh, support uh, failing firms via state aid as opposed to letting the firm from their own customers to, 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 to you know, pay higher prices and support the firm from that way. I, I personally think it's not, but the commission clearly takes a different view. 
And, and so to conclude, um, you know, the way the film from defense has been designed and is applied is neither sufficiently flexible nor clear, uh, but flexibility is important given the nature of this pandemic. Firms rapidly fail, competitive landscape changes quickly. There's no time to meet all these film frame requirements, especially if they're not well-defined, let alone to prove that all the conditions are met. And, and of course, if a merger investigation takes a year, which is what takes, well, actually I'm being, being modest here, it takes now over, potentially over 12 months, I mean, over, over 16 to 18 months on average, uh, including very low long quantification, uh, you know, by then, you know, the application for the fund is irrelevant. Uh, the firm is probably gone bankrupt already. Certainly we are beyond the, in the near future uh, uh, scenario horizon. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude um, this, this, this remarks and looking forward to um, the other speakers and maybe Q and A at the end. Thank you. Many thanks, Miguel. Brilliant speech. Um, so I'll, I'll pass on the, on the floor to, uh, to, to Nico. Nico, you've been involved in, in some of the most important restructurings, uh, both in Netherlands and, and, the, and the EU. In the in the last few years, um, I'd be very interested to know your views and, and the thoughts that uh, that this failing firm uh, defense evokes in a in a restructuring practitioner. So the floor is yours. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, thanks, uh, Adrian. Um, so um, I've I've always found competition law to be a very difficult area of law. Much more difficult than, than insolvency law, which is which is the reason why I'm doing insolvency law and not competition law. And particularly when looking at um, a whole bunch of competition law requirements, I always have difficulty getting my head around the rationale for those requirements. Um, in insolvency law, you know, the law is often self-evident why it is as it is, and I find that much um, less to be the case in in competition law. And and the same is 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 true when you know hearing and, and reading a little bit about the fa this failing firm firm defense so let, let me just give you a couple of the issues that i've been grappling with uh, as an insolvency lawyer lo looking at these uh, at these competition law issues looking at the first requirement um which is this requirement that and i'm, I'm, I'm I'll, I'll i'll limit myself to the eu failing firm defense requirements and taking this first requirement that it is likely that the company, the target company, will go into bankruptcy but for the merger, as um, Roberto and Miguel explained, I, I have difficulty understanding that. Uh, I have difficulty understanding that that requirement. The assumption seems to be that bankruptcy is something absolutely terrible. It'll kill the business. It is something we need to avoid. And therefore this merger needs to take place because otherwise we will have bankruptcy and that is the end of the world uh, and certainly the end of this business. Um, I have difficulty understanding that because I think that is very much an outdated view of, of bankruptcy. Um, many firms enter into bankruptcy or you know, threaten to go into bankruptcy um, even though the firm itself, the business itself is perfectly healthy, but simply because they have a financing problem. Um, they are overburdened with debt and cannot sustain that debt, but the underlying business itself may be viable and very healthy actually. And certainly in the more modern bankruptcy systems uh, and, and definitely in the Netherlands, but also in the UK and also in Germany, uh, bankruptcy is used very much as a tool to resolve that balance sheet problem to shed that um, uh, unsustainable debt and to revive the company, to, uh, sorry, the business, uh, the business activities. And so, whereas my view is that in competition law, bankruptcy is seen as the beginning of the end. In fact, in insolvency practice, uh, bankruptcy is a tool to indeed resurrect that very same business. In other words, to keep that very competitor alive and kicking. So rather than it being, you know, that is the end of the world, that is the, the, it is resurrecting that very same competitor and maintaining a technique to maintain that competitor in the market. So uh, from that perspective, I find it difficult to understand this, this requirement. Um, the second point is also, uh, issue is also re related to this, and th that is this requirement that there is no alternative purchaser around. You know, no one else will buy this, only I will buy this, and so you need to sell it to me, the dominant market player, because otherwise this business will go bankrupt and that is the end of the world. That's kind of the suggestion again. 
Now, um, if, if I just look and, and read a little bit about those EU requirements, the, the suggestion seems to be that uh, you might have to find a buyer who is willing to, um, to purchase the shares in the entity with all of that unsustainable debt. And, you know, very often there will be zero buyers who are willing to buy the shares in the company with all of those liabilities. But there will be a whole bunch of buyers who would be very willing and keen to buy the business itself, leaving all of that debt behind with, you know, after having shed that debt. Uh, and that is something that can typically happen again in the bankruptcy process where, you know, the buyers lie up. Uh, to buy the business and the assets, i.e. the assets and the activities, think of the left side of the balance sheet, and all of the liabilities and owner's contracts are left behind in the old, old entity, and the business itself, without the liabilities, transfers to a new entity. Uh, now, if, you, if, if it is relevant that there's no alternative buyer, I would say that the subject matter of that transaction must not, should not be the shares in the entity, but should be the, the, the business and the activities, the, the assets, the left side of the balance sheet. And if there is no buyer for that, then indeed you might say this business is not viable and you know um, th that might be a reason then to sell it to that one single buyer in the market who, who might still be willing to operate those assets. Um, so in, I, I find that in the EU requirements it is unclear what the subject matter is of the transaction, i.e. the assets and activities of the business or the shares in the company, which are two very different things. Um, whereas if you look at the US approach, the suggestion seems to be of those requirements taken together, that actually you should, the, you know, the, the requirement is that there is no alternative buyer for the business and the assets of the company, um, and, you know, uh, and, and you disregard the debt. So there's no need for the buyer to assume the debt with, uh, you know, along with the, with the business, which I think is a much more sensible approach. Um, one further obs observation is, uh, is again around the importance of there being no alternative uh, buyer for this business. Because, and, and that is where I think um, uh, where the insolvency process and the time constraints in insolvency are critical. Because very often, um, many times in, in insolvency process, there is only one buyer. But that fact is not um, a function of other buyers not being interested. That is simply a function of there being insufficient time to conduct a process to elicit bids from other parties. It's very much a timing uh, phenomenon rather than a lack of interest uh, phenomenon. And that's where the uh, the, the reform in insolvency law that has taken place over the past couple of years plays an important role because the intention has very much been to bring these uh, M&A processes, these, uh, these sale processes forward in time uh, to bring them outside of the scope of a formal comprehensive insolvency process um, and so that you can conduct a proper M&A process, do have time to elicit bids from third parties, do have some sufficient time to set, set up an, a proper uh, due diligence, enable parties to, you know, get their funding in order and so forth. That requires a lot of time many times. Um, and that time is often in a more classical insolvency process lacking. And a lot of the reform has been around improving those processes, bringing them forward in time, a phenomenon you know, where the names speak for themselves, such as the pre-PAC, uh, pre-insolvency proceedings, you know, all of these pre-things, uh, bringing that forward so that you have a better process. And if you have that better process and more time, you're more likely, much more likely, I would even say, to find alternative uh, buyers. And just thinking about it that way, it struck me, uh, and, and that is the final remark that I'll make, uh, it struck me that from a competition policy perspective, um, policymakers also have a large interest, I would say, in having pro and promoting efficient insolvency systems. Because if, bank, if, an efficient, if you have an efficient insolvency system and that insolvency, the bankruptcy, doesn't kill the business, and if you have an insolvency, uh, efficient insolvency pro process that enables uh, you know, multiple buyers to express 
interest uh, and has a, uh, enables and facilitates a proper M&A process to elicit bids from third parties, there will be not much less need to transfer the business to that one dominant player because there will be those alternatives. So it just struck me that also from a competition law perspective, I would think that it makes a lot of sense to promote more efficient insolvency, insolvency systems. So those were a couple of thoughts that I had when I, uh, when I looked at, this, uh, at these topics, uh, Adrian. Many thanks, Nick. Really in considerations uh, that I, I share, uh, uh, fully share as a, as a restructuring practitioner myself. So um, we'll, we'll turn now on the last part of, uh, of this session, which is uh, about the, um, how the interplay between bankruptcy law and, and uh, competition law could be enhanced uh, in certain situations. So let us imagine uh, a business sales process uh, running in a bankruptcy proceeding, which means that this is a process where the business, as, as in a prepack that you mentioned, Nick, would be sold free of debt. And depending on the outcome of the sale process, I'm going to propose you uh, a certain treatment that in principle could be considered to uh, streamline the coordination between bankruptcy and competition law. And then I will ask each of you whether you do agree with the proposed treatment or whether you do not agree and why. So the two scenarios are the, as follows. The first scenario, scenario A, is a scenario where the, there are two offers for the debtor's business. Uh, one of the offers is from a competitor and the other offer is from a non-competitor. And the competitor's offer is higher than the non-competitor's offer. The proposed treatment would be as follows. The non-competitor's offer to be approved by the bankruptcy court. And the reason being because the estate cannot afford the risk and the cost of waiting until the substantiation of the merger control procedure, unless it is kept harmless. Okay, that would be the first uh, treatment for scenario A, which is being proposed. A different scenario now, scenario B. Uh, there are no such two offers, that there is only one offer from a competitor, uh, that is the only offer, and again, the substantiation of the merger control procedure may jeopardize such offer being implemented. The first proposed treatment would be simply to automatically approve uh, uh, that merger from a concentration perspective uh, before the bankruptcy court. And the second proposed treatment would be to also approve that merger, but provided that uh, a valuation is produced that shows that the piecemeal liquidation value of uh, uh, the assets of the debtor has a higher value than the going concern liquidation uh, value of the, of the business, which means that uh, the assets uh, would exit the market necessarily because we, they would be subject in the bankruptcy to a fragmented or piecemeal liquidation by definition because they would have a higher price or recovery for creditors than sold uh, um, altogether as, as a business. Um, so my question would be whether you share uh, that those treatments would enhance coordination between the two disciplines or whether you do not agree with that. So whomever wants to take uh, the floor is welcome. Uh, Robert, I think you're on mute. Adrian, uh, I, I think that the competition authorities and the competition policy is not very likely to grant automatic clearance in any of those scenarios. I mean, uh, the competition authorities will not relinquish the possibility of controlling a merger in case that the only purchaser is a, is a competitor. Um, but it's also uh, what uh, your scenario puts forward is that the problem between that the, uh, um, uh, the potential buyer is a competitor and therefore is someone willing to pay a premium price for the business of the company, which is to the benefit of the creditors and which is the, the, the objective of uh, insolvency proceedings to maximize the um, creditors' welfare. However, competition authorities would like to check whether or not this transaction will uh, prejudice consumers' welfare 
and will take as long as they need in order to uh, ascertain whether or not this transaction uh, um, is to the detriment of consumers. And that will take, as uh, Miguel said, between 12, 18 months sometimes, including the pre-notification phase, which means that the business will be deteriorating and maybe at the end they will um, ban the, the, the transaction. They will not clear it. Therefore, in that case, I think that uh, they will be feel very, very, very comfortable because they think that no harm to the consumers have taken place, but uh, the whole final finality of the insolvency procedures will be empty of any meaning. Uh, no, no sales of business will, will have taken place. No, no uh, suitable price will have been uh, paid. And after 80 months, the business will be much more deteriorated than it was before. So in that case, I don't think that um, uh, automatic clearance is likely to take place and it will be largely incompatible with the finality of the insolvency proceedings. I have described the opposite scenario that you have, you have made, but just to put in uh, everything on the balance. Okay, no, but perhaps I was giving for granted that this was a, a, a treatment proposal uh, of, uh, as we say in Spain, leje, leje, leje ferenda. So I'm not proposing whether that is possible with the current legal framework, but whether the legal framework should be uh, modified so as to allow these possibilities to take place as the most efficient possibilities. And at the end of the day, if you rely on bankruptcy court to run a market process uh, for the uh, for creditor satisfaction, you should also rely on its ability to run a market process in order to satisfy other objectives such as uh, consumer welfare. So um, uh, once that you're relying, you know, and, and, and giving confidence to a bankruptcy court to, to run a, a, a market process of, of a certain asset or business, if you are relying for him, uh, you know, uh, uh, creditor wise, why shouldn't you rely on him consumer wise? That That is... A little bit because, the idea, uh, underlying. Because I think the element that, that um, lacks in what you are saying is what what is driving the judge to take a decision in insolvency proceedings. Usually, it will take uh, it will take care of the objectives of insolvency law. That is why, for example, competition authorities may not trust the judgment as to why or not a proper uh, sale of business process was uh, conducted maybe it should, it should be useful to uh, make it compulsory to judge to take, in to take into account competition law issues in, the, in that proceeding as well. No, but that, that, is, that is fully understood, Roberto. Uh, and, and for the same reason um, that you would be relying on the uh, bankruptcy uh, run market process, you know, to, to determine that there is uh, you know, a second best offer from a non-competitor and that would, uh, you know, prevent the sale to be uh, done uh, to, the, to the competitor for the same reason, on the contrary or conversely, if there is, after the whole uh, process has been uh, run, there is only a competitor's offer, then for the same reason, you should be allowing that offer to, to proceed. So you would have uh, uh, the, the process for the good and the bad, you know, both for finding alternative for changes or for not finding them. Anyway. Um, I may, Nico, uh, yeah. oh, maybe Nico, sorry, I thought you would. No, 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 please. So, no, I, 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 I'm not a lawyer, but I think I, so we not, I don't have uh, enough experience on insolvency law, but I, I, I think I'm trying to get, understand through your, through your scenarios, it, what strikes me is that they are, th th there are two objectives, right? Which of course I think typically may even come into conflict. One is to maximize the value of the uh, assets in, in liquidation and through the process of land bankruptcy. That's in the interest of all the uh, all the creditors. So, so the bankruptcy judge will have to find what is the highest value we can get. Uh, and and then there's the other objective, which is making sure that any uh, any sale of the assets, which um, which may uh, be, you know, to to, to a competitor, uh, does not harm harm competition. So so you have 
Yeah, there's two objectives, maximize the value of the assets, no harm to competition. As always, when you have two objectives, you won't have two different instruments <laughs> uh, because otherwise it's going to be very difficult to, to, to balance them. And that is what one thing creates a conflict here. And just to illustrate, if I was the target in that scenario, the scenario A, uh, I would not want the judge to automatically uh, give precedence to the competition objective and uh, you know, go toward for the non-competitors offer because the competition objective um, you know, actually may, may not be uh, a problem here in the sense that even a, not, even a competitor um, could actually argue that uh, if it takes over this, this assets in distress, uh, it, it, that's not going to create a competition problem because of synergies and efficiencies that precisely as a competitor it can obtain. Uh, therefore, the, even though there's a reduction in, in competition, the synergies, those efficiencies, bringing towards complementary products, uh, you know, reducing fixed costs, etc. All of that means that at the end, there's no harm to competition. So, from the from the failing first perspective, you could argue, wait a minute, uh, I still think that that I should wa I want to go through the assessment of a competition authority and, and have an opportunity to argue that even though um, there is an elimination of a competitor here. Um, the reality is that the synergies are sufficiently important to offset any problem. And that's why the, the competitor pays a high price. Uh, it, it's not just it eliminates a competitor and has more market power. It's also that it, you know, there are synergies there that allows it to, to pay a higher price than a non-competitor would. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I understand the proposal on scenario A. I, I also agree with, with Roberto. I don't see that official authorities relinquishing the, <laughs> their power. Uh, but I also see the, the target saying, wait a minute, you know, uh, give me a chance. Uh, give me a chance to go through the competition pro uh, process. Having said that, it ne almost never works or never works. So <laughs> it's a whole chance only. Thanks, Miguel. Nick, any, any thoughts on this? Yeah, so on your scenario A, um, you have bids, one from a competitor, one from a non-competitor. And, and your proposed treatment is that the court agrees to the lower offer of the non-competitor because if you'd pursue the other transaction, the business would die in the process. That's essentially what you're saying, right? Um, so let, let me, uh, I have maybe two remarks about that. One is the proposed treatment, the, you know, the proposed approach here is in fact what you'd have in the Netherlands because um, here the, uh, the liquidator would have the flexibility and the ability to say, listen, um, this, this transaction with the competitor is all very nice and well, but it's going to take us you know, six months down the road. The business is going to die in the process and we're all going to be left with nothing. So I'm going to pursue this se seemingly lower offer that will actually materialize. So you know, there is flexibility in the Dutch law as it stands at the moment to, to, to do this um, approach. The other suggestion in, in this um, case that you propose is that the transaction to the competitor would be unacceptable uh, or at least difficult from a competition law perspective. Now, that may not be the case. It might be the case that you know, the proposed sale to the competitor with the higher offer is in fact uh, fine from a competition law perspective. And in those circumstances, I was uh, pleasantly surprised to learn, because I had to do some reading up on that, um, that the Dutch merger control process allows a lot of flexibility here. If it is clear, it, and it essentially boils down to this, if it is sufficiently clear that a sale to a competitor doesn't raise competition law issues, the authorities can and will take a decision and give clarity within a matter of days. Um, and so, you know, as long as there's no, no substantive concerns, you can do that sale to the competitor. If it is a very difficult case and there are likely to be competition law issues, completely different story, you might have to go through the whole process. And if you do, I think, uh, you know, any administ uh, um, administrator in a Dutch process would choose the alternative offer if on the table. Um, but in very many cases, a sale to a competitor isn't, doesn't raise material concerns. You do have to make a notification. You do have to go through the motions, uh, but those motions, uh, but, but again, the authorities can give a decision very, very, very quickly and you can get the deal done. Yeah, I, I, I do agree. So it's, it's basically the same point that, uh, that Miguel was, uh, was doing. 
Um, and uh, I, I, I agree that um, if you do have um, um, merger approval in phase one, so very quickly, it, it would make sense to, to go for the, for, the, for the higher offer from the competitor. However, if you don't get in phase one the approval and you have to drag into phase two, which is much longer, um, probably you would have to differentiate between uh, whether the, the underlying business is loss making or profit making. If it is loss making, you know, probably the target and the acquirer would have to, you know, keep harmless the, you know, the estate and, and assure that, uh, that they would cover all these, these losses and not against the price, you know, because otherwise the creators would be affected. On the contrary, if the if the business is profit making, I don't see any problem, you know, in in uh, in withholding um, uh, the 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 you know the the court approval and uh, um, but um, but it might be that the stigma just of the, of the insolvency proceeding simply affects the business irrespective of whether it is profit making or not. Um, if, yeah, so if, if I'm yeah. sorry, I don't know. I thought I thought uh, yes. I, I was just going to. If I may, one, one, just on the last point you made, it's a bit ironic, you know, but it, let's say that if phase one, no competition problems, this is not an issue, as, as Nico said, and as you uh, well summarized, the, the judge can, can go for, uh, you, know, can, can, you know, you can go for the, you, know, you, you can actually go uh, and, uh, and the competition problem, the competition is not going to interfere with additional laws not going to interfere with the merger, there's no competition problems, right? So there's, there's no reason why you shouldn't go through the, um, through the uh, competition process and then get an approval from the competition authority. Now, if, if however, the merger is going to create problems, goes to phase two, and the situation is one where that merger, uh, that, that target would continue to have losses, as you pointed out, so it would eventually uh, essentially not survive uh, a phase two. Now, the, the, the scenario A, what you're proposing is that the, the judge says, okay, automatically, then I'm going to allow the, uh, the sale to the non-competitor, right? Not to the competitor. Uh, but, but that means, this is a big irony, right? That means that the assets will exit the market, right? Those assets will be sold to a non-competitor. The non-competitor will presumably but well, it's not clear, I guess is the point. We don't know what they're gonna do with those assets. Are they going to keep the assets in the market? Uh, are they going to move those assets to a different market? And, and, and that is what the authorities will, you know, will need to decide to apply a firm and firm defense. But you're not, you know, in that scenario, the authorities doesn't have a way on that. The commission authority doesn't have no way on that. Absolutely, Miguel. And, and that, but in the scenario A, we were assuming that the two offers were for the business, okay? If the second offer, it's not for the business, but for the piecemeal assets, for the fragmented assets, then you're totally right. And actually the solution right. that would be applied would be the solution to scenario B, which is that you shall directly right. approve okay. the, you know, the sale yeah. to the competitor with or without evaluation. Because another uh, strange thing is that valuations play an important role in restructurings, but as I see, it, they don't play such an important role in you know, in these situations, when they should, you know, when, when, when the survival of a business is at stake, why don't you, wouldn't you rely on a valuation showing that, uh, you know, the, the piecemeal liquidation value is higher than the going concern business liqui uh, liquidation value, you know? So it's also striking. I mean, Miguel, your, your comments um, um, stru struck a thought with me where you said that where you sell to a non-competitor, the assets are essentially leaving the relevant mar market. And that struck me because potentially, in, potentially, I, I, it's not obvious. Sorry, I, I may it seem as if it was obvious, but it's not. Could could they could stay in the market as well, of course, which I think what Adrian had in mind. Apologies, just want to clarify that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, um, because obviously, uh, you know, in, interesting. Well, just just to just to complete the, the remark, you know, it, the, we always have, of course, the distinction between financial buyers and and the strategic buyers. Strategic buyers are the competitors. Financial buyers are often, I mean, the, you know, they're maybe newcomers. And but the strategic buyers in insolvency processes, because they because of the time constraints and so forth, are very reliant on management. So very often they team up with management and buy the business in that way. It is continued to be operated by management, but then financed by. Uh, this you know new financial investor on the market. The, the funny thing is though that 
uh, from a competition law perspective, that would seem to be an attractive option because you keep this competitor in the market with new funding. So, you know, powerful financial backing, the competitor, this competitor remains in the market. Uh, strangely, from an insolvency law perspective, or maybe, you know, understandably, these types of a transaction where the management remains involved are frowned upon a little bit mm -hmm. and seen as suspect. And, and why is that? That is often because management is involved in the whole pro process, also part of the MA process, and they rig the process, or the suggestion is that they rig the process, and there's a kind of a stitch up to sell the assets back to them, uh, you know, without soliciting bids, higher bids from third parties, and creditors are essentially defrauded um, of value. Now, that might be a legitimate concern if you don't have a proper MA process. But in, if you do have a proper M&A process with sufficient time that is run by an independent third party, you know, that concern falls away. And so it comes back to my earlier point that a lot goes back to having a proper M&A process and running and conducting that process properly with sufficient time. Uh, Nico, what I would say is that the, I, I will take your last point that to have a proper sale process and link it to what Adrian said. Adrian said, you have to trust the judge that the judge is conducting a proper sale process. Well, nowadays, that is not the case under uh, competition law. The, first, it is for the parties to provide evidence that a proper sale process was conducted. Um, they don't mention any judge uh, whatsoever, not particularly the, the judge on insolvency proceedings. And what is further, I don't think that the judges are now concerned about competition law issues when they are conducting a sale of business, even if there, uh, if, uh, there are possi possible competition law issues. They just require, for example, if uh, merger notification is required to, to file the, the, the transaction for prior merger approval. What I want to say is that I think that if competition authorities issue some uh, informal guidance on how a judge or in the framework of a insolvency proceedings, the sale of business should be conducted, maybe we can make it possible for the competition authorities, first, to trust the judge, second, to consider that there is no alternative budget, and to get more reliable information monitored by the judge on how the sale of business was conducted and where, whether or not there are alternative buyers. This will, so, this will also provide some um, time for the competition authorities to think about the objectives and the issues at stake in such process, both from the competition law point of view and insolvency law point of view. Many thanks, Roberto. Very interesting reflections. Um, apologies, but I'm afraid we are running out of time uh, with uh, our, our, our passions. <laughs> so uh, I think it's been uh, really interesting. I think uh, we've seen that uh, bankruptcy law and, and competition law in this point have uh, different objectives, uh, which are potentially uh, conflicting actually. But in the end, the, the techniques that are used by the two disciplines are very, very close. They, in the end, they and in the end, they, they, they both boil down to a matter of, of auctions, auctions and counterfactual analysis, which in restructuring is very much based on, on valuations. And I guess valuations also play an important role in, in the failing for defense and especially to, to show what the counterfactual would look like if you cannot run an auction. Um, and we have also seen that, uh, um, interestingly, again, uh, uh, the US is ahead of, of the EU, both in uh, bankruptcy law as in competition law, which is uh, not a surprise. Uh, but in this particular matter, this is probably due to the fact that in, uh, in the US, they have uh, one uh, single bankruptcy law, uh, which helps to have one sole grammar to speak about the counterfactual analysis, which is one sole bankrupt bankruptcy law. And, and, and they can rely on all the, the economic analysis and on bankruptcy law, which is, uh, you know, uh, consistent uh, 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 in the in the country, whilst in the in the EU we have um, we cannot you know rely on on that uh, sole approach. We have so many different uh, bankruptcy regimes that uh, this uh, is makes makes it much more difficult to have one sole grammar for the, for the counterfactual. And without the counterfactual, 
in this failing from difference method, I guess you cannot really build a, a very consistent system. So hopefully we'll have soon, you know, more harmonization on, on bankruptcy and, and hopefully this will also enhance the, the feeling from defense. So many thanks again, uh, the three of you for taking part in this panel. It's been a pleasure and uh, hope to see you soon. Take care. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Adrian, for moderating the panel. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Omar. Pleasure. Yes. All mine. Right.